Um, so, Dr. Solis, Solis Solis, Solis, and he's always a crowd favorite. So let's give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you for having me. It's my third year, and it's been every year has been more beautiful, more big, more organized, and it's a the vibration, the vibe here is palpable, and I hope we all feel as much as I do. So I'm very grateful for being here again. My whole topic hasn't changed much because I have so much to say about the topic. I'm crazy passionate about it. I am a chiropractor, so we are experts in the body. Uh, I did take some extra training in clinical neuroscience, so I am a board-certified chiropractic neurologist. We don't hear about our profession or our specialists much or our specialty much within the profession, but it does exist. Uh, specifically, chiropractic neurologists, the diplomates specifically, we are rehab experts. So in terms of what I'm trained to do, I am trained to take patients through intensive rehabilitation. And I did that for the first three to four years of my career. I was uh, part of a multidisciplinary team in Dallas where I was part of a research team that treated TBI with PTSD, traumatic brain injuries associated with post-traumatic stress disorder and vice versa. Uh, specifically, the first two years was with treating tier one operators within the military, uh, SEAL Team, Green Beret, MARSOC, PJs, you name it. The whole goal was was take these people, people who had pretty intense stories and these neuroplastic changes, meaning changes to the function of the brain and then rehabilitate it intensively. Because if we're gonna talk about brain and we're trying to change the function of brain, it, it, it takes a recipe. There are certain things that we should take into consideration. A lot of the cool stuff we've heard today are part of the recipe, our immune system, our chemistry, our thoughts, our wellness, our physicality. I happen to be a unique hybrid of our profession where I'm well-versed on a lot of it. So. I love this all. We're going to get into it as much as I can without just rambling because I will, if you know me as a patient or as, as a patient or a person, I will talk for hours and hours about this, but I'm, I've been given a limit. So we'll start with that. So my name is Ross Elise again. I'm a doctor of chiropractic with a diplomate in clinical neuroscience. Here's my boy, one of two, my wife, Dr. Jessica Solis. Also, we practice here in Midwest City uh, or in Oklahoma where she has more of a focus on pediatrics and pregnancy and I have a chiropractic in the neurology background. So I do treat traditional chiropractic patients, but I have a, uh, autism patients, Parkinson's, dementia, traumatic brain injuries, post-concussion, you name it. And then I do my best to be a consultant of neurology for that person and or rehabilitate them. As chiropractic neurology, we use the, essentially we use the patient's body and environment to assess, diagnose, and localize dysfunction. Um, dysfunction, function is a key word that the previous doctor recommended too. That's really what we like to talk about. In traditional medicine, allopathic medicine, they are great pathologists. They are good at determining what is wrong, what's your label. And then after that label's label, then they give you the traditional route. That is what you leave with. You are stuck with X, Y, and Z. Chiropractic neurology really got studied by Dr. Frederick Carrick, who was a PhD from Canada. And then he went to all these, he was a chiropractor. He went to all these, he's another researcher in Cambridge now, you name it. It became really big with stroke rehabilitation because with strokes, you have a suffocated area of the brain, cells die, you can observe on MRI or other imaging, and that's what you're stuck with, essentially. You're stuck with this stroked area of the brain and your function changes, whether it's your arm, speech, walking, you name it. Turns out you can exercise areas around the stroke, though. You can find the areas of dysfunction, find out what functions are in areas next to that area of injury, and then activate those cells. And they've actually shown cellularly that those cells will reach across or reach around other injured areas. And next thing you know, I can have the person move their eyes in a certain direction and speech will come back. It's not that I'm exercising speech, I'm exercising cells next to speech. So we're again trained to localize areas of dysfunction. It's the body is constantly receiving information. We're just this big antenna. It gets processed by the brain and then the brain does something with that information. And we're really, really good and nerdy about observing the human species and based on your eyes or your head tilt or your pupil size or how you walk, your arm swing, the words you may use, the speed of your speech, the speed of your movement, the speed of these little neurological tasks, we can backtrack it to an area of the brain and say, okay, cool, your frontal lobes function at this 
in this way, or your cerebellum functions in this way, or blah, 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 all these other regions of the brain and how they function. So we do use the muscular, neuromuscular skeletal system and the sensory systems that they interact with the neurological system to improve quality of life. We use a variety of uh, modalities, including techniques of adjustments. This is what makes chiropractic so beautiful. If there's one thing that they've shown that stimulates the brain in terms of physical natural activation other than exercise, it's a spinal manipulation or joint manipulation. The cool thing about our profession is I can aim it. If I have a stroke on the left side of the brain, and I'm not, maybe I will aim, if you know kind of how the sensory systems work. If I have a stroke on the left side, the right side of the body is commonly affected. So if I want to wake up that area, I can aim blood flow to the area of injury just by moving that area, which is what neuro rehabilitation and neurophysical therapy does already. We just get a little more specific and we use more tools. So we do use a lot of mod modalities. A lot of it's all natural based, whether it be laser, whether it be balance, whether it be vibration or percussion, you name it, we can aim stimulation into the sensory systems in that way. So neurological rehabilitation, we know for sure in, in the big, so again, in the way I kind of communicate, it's really, I love teaching big concepts. I, I'm a big picture guy, but I'm, I have to fill in the details as I go. So I'll teach you the big concepts. So this isn't specific to kids. Whenever I first start teaching, this is a really big for pandas and pans. And what can we physically do to kind of make up for the spot? Because we, we always address it. We should address it immunologically, chemically, nutritionally. But how can I physically aim the stimulation to the improved? Better, better brain function. So we know neurological rehabilitation in general will improve function, reduce symptoms, and improve well-being of a patient. The benefits of neuro rehabil neurological rehabilitation include functional disorders such as headaches, seizures, dizziness, neuralgia. All those have a spectrum of difficulty, obviously, and a spectrum of outcomes. But we do all help them and we address them. Structural and neuromuscular disorder, degeneration or uh, degenerative disorders, Parkinson's, dementia, Alzheimer's, you name it, in the spectrum of those conditions. We are trained to assess those and then rehabilitate them the best we can and traumatic brain injuries infections and vascular uh, disorders so neuroplasticity is really how any of us do what we do i always teach my patients that we are a language speaking organism our language is then our function so if i i always use this for uh if you have any chronic disorder chronic pain a chronic anything is your brain has spoken that language for a while so that if i have chronic pain yes an injury to the body caused it but after chronicity which is after three months now the brain has wired that pain as well this is essentially the neuroscience of phantom limb pain if you cut an arm off, why does an arm that doesn't exist still have fire? Why does it covered in ants? Why is it being stabbed? All Because the arm still exists in the brain. So you can know that and then treat phantom limb pain by treating the brain, even though the limb doesn't exist. Mirror therapy is always different ways to do that. So neuroplasticity is the ability for the brain to disconnect old connections or, re or create new connections to get a new language or a new function. This is something we've all done in our life, whether it be ride a bike or learn a new language or you name it. Anytime we learn something new and we repeat it, we create physical connections within the brain that can be observed and measured. And we just happen to measure it through function. So the brain's ability to reorganize itself and forming new neuronal connections, which is what we just kind of talked about, and it allows neurons or nerve cells in the brain to compensate for injury and disease to adjust their activities in response to new situations in the environment. It's a big, long way to say, if we can look how the body functions and how it speaks and what language it speaks, we can tell you where that is in the brain and we can learn a new language and get a new function, whether that function be less pain, whether the function be to speak better, to move better, to access memory better, better that's a function. To access memory is a function. If you're an autistic individual and you don't have the same inhibitory pathways of controlling emotions or impulse, those are all functions that if we can identify that and what the person can do functionally functionally, we can exercise it and we can repeat it over and over and over again until next thing you know, they have the ability to every time they get over emotional. I always uh, give a big shout out to Sheila Duffy. She is here somewhere. I'm so blessed to see her son once a week. And for the years I've been treating him, he can now listen or listen to us say, hey, breathe, Connor. And he'll breathe. That is an inhibitory function that originates in the frontal lobes down to the brainstem into the cerebellum that gives us more emotional control. We've been told this as humans for birth, for pain, for you name it, but we can use it for all types of function. 
So how do we enhance neuroplasticity? So you have to understand neuroplasticity exists, meaning you can change an old brain. You know, the whole, uh, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You can, the dog just becomes more stubborn. So you have to find a way to reach that brain. You have to find a way to reach into it. I'm, Alzheimer's is a fun topic. I love it because there's great tons of YouTubes on it. There's great videos of people who have Alzheimer's and you put on music from the past and it wakes up their spirit and soul because those connections still exist. So me as a practitioner, when I meet with anyone that has these you name it, let's just say degenerative disorders from long term or chronicity or they've been there, they've lived life longer than others. I do my best to tap into the past. I have a Parkinsonian patient right now who loves soccer, but he can't play soccer and because of function, he doesn't think about it. But his first homework with just meeting him and consulting one consulting with him was kick a ball around. And he loved it. It woke up his soul. It woke up connections in the brain that are so subconscious that we just overthink now these days that he has more drive now that, hey, I can, I do know soccer. I do love soccer. So neuroplasticity matters, but we have to still enhance it because we all have it, but it doesn't mean it's going to work. So good sleep. I'm going to say some things that are obvious to all of us, but you're going to say, yeah, right. If it was that easy, I would be doing it. Sleep is the number one thing. And at the end of this slide, I did add, I had add to it every year. I'm going to talk about some of the things that we're talking about to get good sleep, but we do need good sleep. And specifically when it comes to Alzheimer's, we don't talk about too much of cause and correlation, but there's one thing that all of us should know, whether we have it or not, is statistically, it's not looking good for a lot of us. One in two over the age of 85 will have something. One in eight over the age of 65 will have something. Uh, it's just, it's just what statistics are saying. And that was about eight years ago statistics. So we'll see what it is today. But the point is, is we had to keep it going. We're all potentially here, but if there's one cause and causation that they're really kind of starting to say, yes, it's the case in a lot of these cases is sleeplessness early on in life. We need sleep. It's when our brain detoxes the most. It's when the brain cleans out extra plaques and proteins and you name it the most. So if there's one thing I could spend hours on alone, it's like, what can I do to get you to sleep? In my Dallas experience and career, when I was treating these guys, primarily in the tier one operations, guys who didn't sleep for 10 years for darn good reason. When it comes to PTSD, you don't cure it. You get really good at having PTSD. You manage it. So I was a part of a team though. I don't like to say I do stuff because it's really the person doing it, but we were able to get guys to fall asleep after 10 years just by making them exercise their brain more, using their eyes more, you name it. And once they got better sleep, they got better function, better neuroplasticity. When, the, when in doubt, the best thing to grow your brain and learn something new, promote neuroplasticity, plasticity is learn something new. Uh, just do something you don't want to do. You don't want to take out the trash. Some of you are going to use this. Do it. It will grow your brain for that moment. If you don't want to do something, do it. Who's familiar with the cold plunge uh, craze and that works on neuroplasticity in overcoming a mental stress. I'm not sure if you looked into the science of the neurons, neuroscience of it. One of the biggest psychological effects of cold plunges is mentally saying, don't get out. And then overcoming that motion, surrendering to the challenge of it. And that brain is forced to build more connections within the frontal lobes. So the next thing you know, you come out of that. And they've shown, the research is showing you get two and a half times the amount of dopamine for the rest of your day, if not more, after one three minute cold plunge whole nother topic and discussion because I'm still working on convincing myself to do cold showers. I can do plunges. The cold shower on the bald head is different. Maybe you know. It's different on the... Prove it. If not, keep moving. Movement is life. That's why our profession is so good at this. I love the chiropractor before this. There's a, uh, another physical doctor after this. Movement is life. We need movement. And one of my favorite ways that we are taught this is a certain type of jellyfish. When a jellyfish, I forget the name of it, but they will essentially swim around the ocean. And eventually, whenever they're, they're, they're called immortal jellyfish, because they will eventually land on the ground, become a polyp, and the polyp is lifeless. But the first thing the jellyfish will do once it lands is eats its own nervous system because it doesn't need it. Movement is life. And there's one thing I do for my patients that are immobile. I have a quadriplegic blind patient I see. And it's the biggest question I get is, what can you do for her as a chiropractor? I move her. I move her body because she can't. I find ways that she can move it. I find ways her caretakers can move it. I have a, a vaccine injured nine-year-old boy who's about that big. And gets, he's essentially lifeless. He gets carried around forever. Um, I move him. I do what he can't do and sure enough functions improve. So movement, movement is key to neuroplasticity. 
decreasing stress easy again easier said than done so my whole concept is is getting good at being stressed being good at having stress being good at having these things that stress us um having a focus and purpose that's another deep talk but very important for neuroplasticity if i want my patients to get better what do you want why are you here? What do you want to get out of this? Obviously, you may want to walk better, talk better, but what do you like? What, what are you here for on this planet? Because without purpose, we don't have dopamine. And one of the dri biggest driving forces of creating new circuits is dopamine. And dopamine is motivation. Dopamine is purpose and vice versa. So you need all of those. And it's a whole nother talk on depression. Depression is often prescribed SSRI, serotonin, the happy chemical. But when you look at what depression is, sometimes it's a lack of dopamine. You don't get excited. You don't have purpose. So a lot of SSRI patients will eventually get prescribed dopamine because they're inverse of each other. Another deep, deep stuff. Good foods. That's our nutrition. That's our chemistry. Good thoughts. The previous conversation was perfect for that. We must have good talk, thoughts. In my practice, if I'm rehabbing someone especially, we don't do I can't. I try. I'll take. I'll try. We'll do that. But I can't. I won't. All right, cool. Well, then good luck creating new connections with that thought process and then good actions. So there are, again, principles to neuroplasticity. We need the age does matter. Uh, again, the previous doctor said it right. When it comes to seeing the majesty, the magic of chiropractic or of nutrition or donkey milk, age does matter. There, it sounds kind of weird how I'm going to say this, but a child isn't soiled the way the older we get. They're pure. They're, they don't have the, the insecurities, the thoughts. They don't have all this stuff that as adults that we obtain in our plastic connections, our childhood traumas. It's just, it's not as much. So I can apply a treatment or a stimulation to their brains. You're going to see much quicker neuroplastic changes. So it's really fun to work with them. Um, the intensity of the treatment matters. Again, I'm not sure if I kind of describe this, but to be honest, in the research, if you want to change very um, complex neurological disorders, intensity treatment, intensive treatments have the best results. People that see clinicians two to three hours a day, I was seeing these veterans and other people three hours a day for five to 10 days. It takes repetition. But in my little clinic of Midwest City, this is the original design is to have these intensive clinics around the States, which I still refer to every now and then, but then to come back to someone like me, where it's more like your home and then keep it going. So intensity of the rehabilitation does matter. The more intense and more connections you're trying to make. Salience, which is uh, essentially has to be motivating, has to be fun. So I'm a child at heart. So for my child patients, we are eye to eye. I try to take my older patients and try to bring out the the kid that we all are and then I put on music I try to make them laugh I try to remember like hey what did you do as a kid what sport did you do and we try to use that as a as a motivation as a treatment time matters but the big thing we can go on and on about what matters for neuroplasticity but age transference is a big one if you practice something in a nearby area of the brain it will transfer to the air er other areas of the brain I always like to use that speech when I talked about with strokes there's an area of the brain on the left side called Broca's Broca's area and then Wernicke's this is speech perception of speech and then active speech, creating speech. Now, I'm not a great guy, so it's not that easy. There's more speech centers on the right and things like that. It's gotten more complicated than just this or the left brain of speech. But there's another area just adjacent to the frontal, uh, to the Broca's area called the frontal eye fields. Frontal eye fields are what creates saccades whenever you look left and right or we pursue a target. So if I want to stimulate the left Broca's regions or frontal lobes on the left side, I can use the frontal eye fields right next to it, which essentially means I have a patient saccade to their right, quick movements to the right, or pursue a target to the left. It's just the function of the eyes for the brain. And knowing that just allows us to aim it and use it intentionally. So really cool fact in that sense. And repetition does matter. Again, me and my practice, I either become a consultant, meaning I teach what I'm doing now. I tell you this stuff even exists, because if you don't know it exists, what are you going to do? And your knowledge is power. So one of my favorite things to do is just teach. I want to take everything I have in here. I'm a nerd, guys. I'm that one person that whenever they created podcasts, they're like, these aren't going to work. Who's going to sit and listen to a three-hour podcast? I do. I will listen to a three-hour podcast on you name it. I love it. And I'm ADHD, by the way. So that just goes to show I've worked on my own brain in certain senses. But it does take repetition. So I either become your consultant or I will rehab you. And if you're sitting in front of me for an hour, you don't get a chance to not sit up correctly. You don't get a chance to not breathe deeply. You don't get a chance to not, or to have hurtful thoughts. I am rehabilitating you with every moment that you essentially pay me to do. 
So how do we exercise the brain? Essentially, we use our senses. We use all the receptors that feed the brain. As an organism, whenever we're in the womb, we start as a little nodule of cells, and then we expand and we grow. And there's two specific things we always talk about in the brain are the eyes. These two little nodules come out, and they move out into the front of the skull, and that's the eyes. The eyes are the brain. So the biggest sensor that makes chiropractic neurologists different than maybe a vestibular neurologist or other types of chiropractic knowledge is that we're very heavy in using the eyes if I'm going to rehab your brain. I look at the eyes and I use the eyes. Even for my blind patient, she still can mentally observe space. So she can't see with her eyes, but I have her point her eyes into a visual or auditory stimuli as a way to fixate the brain. So we use taste, we use smell, we use sight and, uh, and touch, which is movement and body and muscles. The big thing that separates us again separates us again is the vestibular system. Who's familiar with the vestibular system? system, the inner ear system, our balance system. The worse the brain gets, the worse balance gets. We can see this in gait. You see it in Parkinsonian gait, that canthocormic posture, the shuffling of the feet. You see it in autism. You see it with traumatic brain injuries. Balance is a function of the brain. So if I want to see how your brain functions, I test your balance. Now it's not as, because some people are like, well, crap, I have terrible balance. If you don't exercise it, you don't have good balance. It doesn't mean it's immediately a bad brain. It just means you don't use it. So I will make sure I assess it to make sure you can use it. And hopefully it works for us because the vestibular system and those cells are the oldest group of cells in the entire brain meaning as we're developing we're the only species that stands upright against gravity we're the only ones that do it throughout our entire life us me standing here now even sitting in your chair is a balancing act we're the only ones that do it this way so if we knew that development god's pretty cool in his design he knew that that vestibular system embeds into every single system of our body organ function blood flow heart thoughts you name it the eyes are the window into the brain. I already talked about that. Really, to summarize this slide, they've done a lot of really cool studies. And what's the correlation between eye speed, eye accuracy, eye latency, how quick it takes to respond to a target in relation to cognition, learning, dementia, Alzheimer's, frontal lobe dementia, uh, Parkinson's, you name it. The slower the brain, the slower the eyes move. The less coordinated the brain, the less coordinated the eyes move. We know this, we can measure it. So I do use a tool in my clinic, depending on the case. That's a video nystagmography. It's used quite a bit in ears, nose, and throat doctors. It's traditionally used to measure, uh, essentially they do caloric tests. They measure your vestibular system for that purpose. I'm measuring how quick do your eyes move to the right? How quick do they move to the left? up, down, side to side, how quickly and how well can they hold stability on a target? Those are all different brain regions that when you look at that and you assess it, you can enhance the brain. By the way, let me just teach you one thing today. If you want to leave here with one exercise to do for sure, try to keep your eyes still on the target with movement. Intentionally, if you're going to exercise and lift weights in a gym, or you're going to play balance exercise. I do martial arts. I do jujitsu. I do different things. I will use my eyes and fixate on targets to give me more stability. You may know this back in school. If you're going to balance on a foot, they say, find a spot two feet in front of you. It will stabilize you. So if I want to enhance, and by the way, I keeping the eyes still on the target is frontal lobes. Most of us need more frontal lobe function. So if I ever want to enhance frontal lobe function through any kind of therapy, whether as I give an adjustment, I have them fixate on a target and then we stimulate the system. So tons of stuff you can do in the eye. The eyes, again, this is a good slide just to show it is voluntary and reflexive. So for some of my patients, I will have them do volitional eye movements. Some of the times I'm just making the eyes move for them. Uh, we do do colors. Colors do have a different meaning, targeting, spatial orientation, awareness. In terms of the motor function of eyes, there's... There is a hierarchy of stimulation, so certain eye exercises are harder than others. Keeping the eyes still, the lowest intensity, but difficult, but very doable. And then moving an eye spontaneously are called saccades in different directions. Pursuing a target is more difficult, and then there's more and more from there. I'm always full of fun facts, so I'd like to share this one. Here's how you know the eyes are important for frontal lobes and dopamine and stimulation. Anytime you go somewhere new, vacation, somewhere exciting, what do we all do? You look around. You're saccading everywhere. You just look around. You take it all in. That's all frontal lobes. Your brain is stimulating and doping. You're getting motivated. You're getting reward. But then when you lose dopamine, you live in the same area for a while, you don't look around. You just kind of look straight ahead of you. Your eyes aren't saccading as much, and you're just not observing the world as much. So you can use saccades. And by the way, this goes the opposite way. On too much dopamine, my little, my patients are autistic patients, the spectrum disorders. 
what's the first thing that we tend to look at? How well do they make eye contact? They're over dopamine. So they're all over the place. They're just seconding everywhere because they appreciate everything in the world too much at times. So the vestibular system affects everything, the eyes, the feet, the balance, the control, the posture of systems as chiropractors. We should get taught more, but we're not in school. But the, there's some of us out there, like the previous doctor, again, that we decide to go search for more information. If I claim to be a chiropractor affecting the curvatures of the spine and affecting the joints, I should know that the vestibular system is what creates all of that. The vestibular system, as I have a two-year-old, he's running around, so he's past some of these stages. But the things that we look at for kids is can they lift their head up? Can they roll over? Can they transition? These are all spine curvature events. The event of looking up and crawling, that's creating the lordosis curves of the lumbar spine of the neck, that little curve. And these are all things that the brain does. So it's just really beautiful how we're connected. Here's a beautiful slide. I think you have access to all this, by the way. This is essentially saying how we can use the vestibular system to treat stress, anxiety. This is why I spin all of my autistic children. It's just fun if I can spin an adult. Actually, the adults are less likely to like it. Probably for a good reason. They don't have as much confidence in their balance. The kids love it. So it's a great stimulation for their brain. So one of the things, uh, Rewalk the, Re the Spectrum, I think it's the same name. I'm not sure. Sheila Duffy knows. But they have a great facility. I believe uh, the previous doctor's wife, they are trying to incorporate the same thing in their, their learning facility where let's allow kids to spin. If you have a trampoline and you have a kid or as an adult, again, be careful as an adult, we get weaker, weaker more fragile, but balance. Bouncing is the vestibular system because when the HPA axis, that's hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal, it's a stress axis of the brain. When the HPA axis is chronically activated for any reason, this creates a feedback loop that further disrupts the balance systems or the vestibular function. Anything that disrupts the stress axis, emotional, traumatic, environmental toxicity, which has been talked about today, chronic infections, lack of sleep, etc., can all disrupt the vestibular function and vice versa. So we need to know about how our inner ear is functioning and there's ways to assess that and know about that. The cranial nerves, there are about 12, or essentially 12 pairs, yeah, 12 pairs that come off, uh, 12 on each side, that we all instantly get feedback to right directly into the brain. So if I'm gonna have someone wake up their brain or do something to do something directly to their brain in terms of blood flow and activation, we use the cranial nerves. That includes spinning the body. That includes uh, lion face, moon face. That's lion face, moon face. Great brain exercise, just looks weird. Don't do it in public unless you just want to. Electrical stimulation to the face will do that. Uh, humming, breathing, gargling, that's the cranial nerve nine, the glossopharyngeal, or the, essentially the um, vagus nerve, that's 10, nine and 10, glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerve, the best nerves that, my favorite nerves that we can activate in the body in terms of regulate, regulating autonomic functions, automatic functions. So breathing, humming, gargling, laughter, singing, these are all brain exercises. These are all things that we can do intentionally if we just decide to. Intentional breathing, if you know me again, is my stuff. I've gotten way better at not cussing, by the way. If y'all know me, you welcome. I That little no cussing when I walked in, I, I, I almost took offense to it. I thought they were talking to me, but it's not. I think it's everyone in general. I almost, I just caught myself. That's why I'm taking a pause. So thank you, me. Intentional breathing is the best thing that we can do at any time, anywhere. If there's one thing I've seen get more work done just from teaching someone to do something for their brain is intentional breathing. I, You can't move certain patients. They don't feel confident. They don't have the energy. They can't do X, Y, and Z. Kid, you're already breathing, so I already know you can do breathing. I've taught into breathing from anyone to my three-year-old up to an 84-year-old. The act of focusing on the sound of breath, the feeling of breath, the breath, the pace of breath, the ratio of inhale versus exhalation, these all take focus and attention and brain function. This is the neuroscience of meditation if you've looked into it and the blood flow that it takes. So to intentionally breathe, it involves enhancing frontal lobe function, which is focus, executive function, regulation. Meditating does affect and decrease the overactive firing of the limbic system, which is our survival responses. The hypothalamus, the brain stem, the cerebellum, these are all vital functions to our brain that will go away eventually at certain points in our life. Intentional breathing will regulate and exercise that. So I can go on and on about that, so I should move on. This is the cycle of meditation. Anyone meditate actively? Call it prayer, call it meditation, whatever you want to do, but to sit quietly with an intentional focus without trying to think of the future or the past with non-judgment is clinical meditation. It could be prayer. It could be 
you name it, breath. A lot of people say, I can't meditate. My mind is all over the place. I can't think. Well, that has been a misconception about meditation a long time ago. This is the true cycle of meditation. Meditation is supposed to be the act of acknowledging that you're not being present and then recorrecting it. It's a cycle. So I will always in my rehabilitation, if not the first time or taken through the therapies, I will teach intentional breathing therapy so that if when you leave me, you have the intensity, the ability to increase blood flow to your brain at any choice, at any moment, even as you're sitting here listening to me. If you are just listening to this talk right now and listen to your breath as you inhale and focus on the exhale, you just sent blood flow to your brain and it will have a long lasting effect eventually. Efficient movement is efficient function. So I do in my, if you've heard of primitive reflexes, I do test those. Those are reflexes that we should all be done with essentially past the one year old, but we still retain them depending on the function of the brain. I've seen a lot of older people eventually get brain injuries or decreased function, and these reflexes should be gone, but they're just being inhibited technically. So they're always there, but the brain function decreases, they wake up again. So you can test an elderly person or a traumatic brain injuries rooting reflex, and they will go for a nipple that should be long gone, but they still do it. So these are reflexes that we must know about. Midline exercises, core, balance, you name it. If there's one thing I still do to this day is I will walk on a curve tandem because why not? I told you the statistics. It's not looking good. I will always eventually be doing dishes. I play video games. I will stand on one leg while I you know, challenge my brain with video games, but I might as well be doing something good for me as I challenge it in other ways. So hemisphere, uh, if you've heard of brain balance centers, we do use this hemispheristic concept, weak breath, weak left brain, strong right brain, depending on the case or vice versa. We do, and we should take that into consideration. It does matter. So we do a lot of cross crawl function. There's different movements you can do. And then really fun exercise are go, no go exercise. Things that make us essentially inhibit our impulses. So there's tons of things we can do for that. Again, I can talk forever about chiropractic, the vibration of the body, the stimulation of the body, whether it be activator, acupuncture, movement, rehabilitation, you name it. Use the body to stimulate the brain when in doubt. I do use different uh, balance pads, yoga balls, uh, mirror therapy, which is another way to just kind of become more aware of your function. The trampolines, like I said, I use everything for balance. I do use cold laser, a low level light therapy. There's different forms and classes of laser, but when in doubt, it's natural. It's the sun right now is a type of laser that we're all benefiting from. We're all a frequency based organism and they've found out some pretty cool science with lasers that you can program frequencies to specifically program or activate specific cells. So I do use that in my clinic as well. All right, I'm gonna, I think I'm about to finish here soon. Yeah, I'm about to be done. But let's just talk about sleep real quick. Um, this is a quote. Uh, anyone heard of Dr. Andrew Huberman yet? Please, if you want to know some recipes to life, that's what's so cool about this neurologist from Stanford. Uh, we've been told a lot about, you know, meditation, cold plunges and saunas, but what they're starting to do now in whether it be sleep, we know all these things to do, but we don't know how long do I meditate for? How long do I sit in a cold bath? How long do I sleep? How do I do all these things? Well, there are recipes to it now, so I'm going to get into that in a second. But the best, this is his quote, the best nootropic, sleep. The best stress relief, sleep. The best trauma release, sleep. The best immune booster, sleep. The best hormone augmentation, sleep. The best emotional stabilizer, sleep. I have certain chronic, uh, neurological cases that come to me that will call me and say, hey, I can't get him to wake. He's sleeping. That's more therapeutic than anything I can do. Stay home and sleep. If we want all of us to sleep... Uh, so here's how to do it, though, according to Dr. Huberman. I'm just going to read off this. You can go get more at his website. It's on this PowerPoint. You can get later. I did this to my son the other day, actually, this first number one. The best thing you can do is within the first few minutes of waking up, 36 minutes, is get direct sunlight. It does change on the timing of the cloudiness, of the raininess, and the sun exposure. My son had to get up early, that earlier than usual for school, and he knows my little tricks. I, I apply this to our life. He's growing up in a weird household, but hopefully it, it pans out. So I woke up. His lifeless little body went pee and I carried him and just held him out in the sunlight for about 10 minutes because it naturally stimulates the circadian rhythms. And then before we go to bed the night before, I exposed him to natural dim light from the sun going down the sunset. This is all stuff that's well studied. So if you have troubles with sleep, if you can't get your person or individual that you're a caretaker of to fall asleep, just follow some of these recipes. Just put them in the sun. He doesn't need to know what he's doing or she. And then put them in the sun down. There are recipes to this and it all works. Wake up at the same time every day. That doesn't matter. And try to go to sleep at the same time, especially when you first start feeling sleepy. 
Avoid caffeine within the 8 to 10 hours of bedtime. If you do have sleep disturbances, there are tons of exercises, self-hypnosis, applications on your phones, intentional breathing, 4-8 uh, breathing. That's my, first, uh, my favorite ratio. Inhalation is a fight or flight function. <gasps> right? That's what we do when we get scared. We inhale. We get relaxed. <sighs> Exhalation is a rest and digest or parasympathetic healing function. So if you can just play with those ratios, you can intentionally calm the body. I can slow my heart rate on command just by f focusing on an exhalation. I can inhale my blood pressure on command by inhaling intentionally and hyperventilating essentially and with controlled function. These are all things we can do. Avoid seeing bright lights before bed, especially between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. This stuff works. I'm telling you, you don't have to like these answers, but this is what they're saying to do. So avoid LED light, avoid, you name it. Any, I, whenever it becomes bedtime, the sun starts going down, all our LEDs get turned off, all orange lights get turned on, if anything, candle light. And by the way, Dr. Human says any light that's artificial throws it off. So candle light, things like that, orange lights are better, red lights are better, but better than bright white LEDs. Uh, limit naps to 90 minutes max. You just don't, it, it will throw off your circadian rhythm. Or don't nap at all, but he does, and I do recommend at least 20-minute naps, meditations, whatever you want to call it. If you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't fall back to sleep, consider doing some of these brain-based relaxation techniques. There are supplements, of course, you can take that he lists. I take magnesium 3 and 8. Uh, I take other types of magnesium. I do do other, uh, like fish oils, you name it. Uh, expect, by the way, about an hour before your bedtime to feel an extra boost of alertness. It's normal. Don't take that as a reason to go do stuff. Just still follow the schedule the best you can. Keep the room cool. Anyone know the actual room temperature we're supposed to sleep in for the brain? What is it? It's around 69, 68 degrees. Yeah, it's it's not what I've heard. I'm not saying anything specific about the species, but females may or may not like. I, My female wife companion has told me this, but she gets it now. It's the truth. That's why fevers will throw us into different dream states and affect our sleep because we do get hotter. So the cooler, the better. Darkness is ideal. I know we like to put TV on to fall asleep, but man, it will affect us whether we know it or not. Drinking alcohol does affect us sleep, even though we use it to relax us. Even something I'm going to say that I'm actually a supporter of in some instances, cannabis, as much as it's a great thing for certain people, they have found it does affect the true circadian sleep cycle. So it's just something to know about. Just be aware of it. Um, and then we all have changing sleep needs, sleep needs, so adjust accordingly. I can go on and on and on and on about all these subjects. I hope I've just told y'all something that maybe you didn't know about. There's more knowledge to know that's out there that is very detailed and accessible. I happen to be someone that lives for it and loves it. I'm addicted to it. Um, I do do it for fun. So I think I'll be here walking around. I'm not, I might be part of this panel later. I'm not sure how that's going to work, but uh, I do teach it. I will show you and tell you as much as you allow me to thank you share gratitude with each other show compassion i have a theory that if there's one class we should all apply to the whole world is compa compassion classes i think the whole world would benefit from grade school on if we were required by law to take compassion classes to know what it's like to be in someone else's shoes so that's my little you know pet peeve and little to do there but i'm at vibrant soul chiropractic in midwest city thank you for letting me speak to you all again and kind of go quickly through this, but there's just so much information. So thank you all so much. Appreciate you. That was fast. Smile, y'all, but that's a lot.